Public Economic and Trade Cooperation between Taiwan and the Philippines under the Southbound Policy. Okay, so let me introduce to you our speaker for today. She is the director of the Taiwan ASEAN Studies Center at the Chunghua Institution for Economic Research. Her, her areas of research interest include Southeast Asian Studies, Regional Economic Integration, International Trade Policy and Economic Trade Law, including issues on trade and development and gender. She gives advice to the Taiwanese government, particularly on Southeast Asian regional policy, including the, the new South Bank policy and other trade-related policy areas. She also leads the joint feasibility study of FTA with a number of Asian countries. She currently serves as an adjunct research fellow at the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, a senior advisor to the Taiwan Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, and an advisory member to the Trade and Development Committee of the Republic of China, National Confederation of Industries, as well as to the International Affairs Committee of the ROC Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Christy Su. Um, thank you very much, and um, Dr. Reyes, and also uh, Dr. King Ram, and uh, distinguished guests. I'm very honored to be here to present to you uh, Taiwan of Philippine Economic Relations. Uh, my presentation later will be highly complementary to uh, the ADB's paper because I focus more on investment, uh, responding to uh, the China-U.S. trade war. So, and, uh, so first I'll talk about the China-U.S. trade war and then uh, second I'll talk more about Taiwan Philippine economic relations and how we can take advantage of the current uh, international environment to move for, to move forward. So uh, as uh, ADB presenter already uh, uh, mentioned to you that uh, the U.S.-China trade war actually is hurting the world economy. And uh, uh, a lot of international organizations have expressed a lot of warnings to that. And for U.S. and China, no one is actually winning the war. Actually, uh, the argument is which is losing less. It's not about lo it's not about winning more, but uh, losing less. And for Taiwan, uh, though we hope that we could have more benefited from the trade war, but the situation is last year our GDP growth rate went down to 2.6 uh, percent, and probably this year the GDP may uh, going a bit uh, a, a bit uh, further down. And also our trade performance also impacted. And uh, in, in East Asia, who will benefit and who will, lo who will lose? And currently there is a lot of uh, attention in this part of the world because uh, in this part of the world, in Southeast Asian country, some countries due to their increasing trade uh, surplus with the U.S., they are under uh, increasing pressures. But there are also countries that now may have a different uh, a trade uh, policy. For example, uh, a, a large, very large economy in this region is now getting more trade protectionist. Like last year, uh, that country has unilaterally raised tariff on, um, uh, uh, I think, a few hundreds, uh, a few hundreds items. So this table shows you that um, why Trump is so angry about China because um, uh, China's trade surplus with the United States grew from uh, around th uh, 300 billion in uh, 2011 to uh, 42, 42 uh, 420 billion uh, US dollars in 2018. So despite of the tariffs, uh, the trade surplus with the US is still growing. And uh, this is Taiwan. Last year, we have about one uh, 15 billion uh, trade surplus with, chi with, chi uh, with U.S. And our government is now under huge pressure, uh, huge pressure. So we need to procure more from the U.S. And apart from uh, 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 among the Southeast Asian countries, you can see from here that Vietnam actually has a very outstanding uh, trade performance with the U.S. And their trade surplus with the U.S. Uh, growing from 13 uh, billion US dollars to uh, 39 billion US dollars in uh, 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 last year. And uh, a lot of Turkish companies are now considering Vietnam to be the best, to be among the best uh, destination for their further uh, manufacturing operation. But companies already existed in Vietnam for years are now beginning to worry about that uh, the, uh, Vietnam may 
same as China, receive more trade remedy measures from, uh, 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 from U.S. or other countries. And this is Thailand, and this is, uh, this is Malaysia, which all have increasing trade surplus uh, with the U.S. Philippine, uh, the, export, the export from Philippines to U.S. has already increased in the past years. However, compared with other Southeast Asian countries, you are now uh, away from the radar screen. And, uh, it, and it's not just about tariffs. Uh, uh, according to the USTR report released in 2017, and uh, the report says the U.S. needs to see fundamental changes of um, Chinese trade regime and other industrial policy. So now we know it's more about trade, it's more about tariffs, it's actually more about technology, more about industrial, uh, uh, industrial development, and more about the Made in China 2025, uh, 2025 plan. So this uh, identifies 10 key sectors and also uh, their plans in the next 10 years and also uh, uh, years before, tw uh, before uh, 2040, 2049. And uh, because of this, because of this uh, uh, rationale uh, behind Trump administration. So apart from trade, they have a number of other measures, for example, the trade, uh, uh, trade control, export control of high technology goods to the US and also other, other, other measures. And uh, that's about trade. And what about investment? We see uh, from the World Trade, uh, the, uh, the World Bank's uh, investment uh, statistics that uh, last year, uh, 2017, we see global FDI outflows decline from the peak uh, at about seven, uh, 744 billion in 2015, decline for three consecutive years. And uh, uh, in the year 2017, you see uh, the FDI outflows from US Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan continue to, uh, continue to grow amidst rising trade protectionism and policy uncertainties. Because these uh, companies in these countries believe they have to go directly into uh, countries where they believe they will be more comfortable and also more friendly uh, investment environment. And uh, Taiwan, uh, we are uh, we have been investing hugely in China, also in Southeast Asian countries. For example, um, we have uh, FDI stock in China exceeding 300 billion US dollars. And right now, all a lot of Taiwanese companies are considering to move from China. So uh, this kind of a new trend of Taiwan uh, investment moving moving out from China may uh, may uh, create or lead to a new phenomenon, which is uh, China-centric supply chain, as uh, demonstrated by the, a uh, uh, the ADB uh, paper, uh, to decentralize the supply chain across different countries. And uh, the impacts on uh, FDI activities, and this shows you the uh, uh, FDI inflow. Uh, as you can see from here, this is um, Purple. The purple is um, the U United States. The FDI inflows into the United States decline sharply uh, from the peak around from the peak at 465 billion in 2015 to uh, less than 300 billion US dollars. So the United States, because of their new trade policy, and they have stopped um, they have stopped the country from receiving more FDI uh, 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 inflows from other countries, in particular the inflow from China. And also uh, the FDI inflows into China, which is about it is this color, this color, this color, remain to be strong because despite all this, uh, all this uh, 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 export opportunities, China remains to be a huge domestic market. And uh, in 2017, inflows into Southeast Asia reached a peak uh, at about 133 billion US dollars. That means a lot of companies are actually target, uh, targeting as Southeast Asian countries for their next, uh, next destination. And uh, um, this shows you Taiwan's investment uh, flow in the past years. And you can see from here that starting in 2010, 2010 here. This is our investment going to China. Continue to uh, continue to rise uh, and stopped at 2010, and uh, and then after 2010 uh, continue to, to to decline. 
So this happened before the trade, uh, the United uh, U.S. China trade war, because companies are beginning to feel they uh, the, the Chinese investment environment have become less friendly to them. So uh, and also because of the acceleration of the uh, AEC, for example, uh, ASEAN Economic Community, and also the integration in this region. Uh, 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 so long before the U.S.-China trade war, a lot of companies are already relocating from China to other to other parts. So uh, where where did they go from China? Uh, Southeast Asia and also South Asia, Vietnam in particular, Cambodia, and whether they will come more to Philippines, we don't know yet. We have to find more evidence to show that uh, the Philippines is actually uh, one of their uh, uh, destination in consideration. They also go to uh, India. For example, we talk about emerging uh, supply chain or emerging a uh, cluster of smartphone assembly. Uh, contributed by new Taiwanese investors in that country, so they go to uh, they go to India, and uh, in Taiwan may benefit from the U.S. trade war because a lot of Taiwanese company uh, they have operations in China are now considering to coming back home uh, because if you if you have to stay overseas. Why not come back to Taiwan? And that's the current most important policy considerations for our government. And the government is now trying to provide all the incentives and all the encouraging uh, measures to bring uh, these companies back home. And also they are going to directly go to US, for example, for steel company and also for electron large electronic company like Foxconn. Foxconn already committed huge investment in Wisconsin state. Why don't you go directly to the market? So, uh, and also for petrochemical. So, um, instead of uh, instead of staying in China, they are now going uh, going uh, into different countries. And uh, this shows you Taiwan's FDI outflows in this part of the region. And as uh, as of end of last year, and this is our time, our FDI stock in this country. So, about one third of our total investment goes to. Uh, uh, Vietnam goes to Vietnam. Uh, why? Because uh, because of the population, because of the government. Uh, the government uh, usually a less uh, democracy government tends to be more efficient. So they go to uh, Vietnam, and also uh, and this company going to Vietnam actually have helped establish more establish a supply chain over there. So uh, they go to Vietnam, and they are there are a lot of uh, investment in Thailand, in Singapore, in Malaysia, and for still for Philippines, unfortunately, uh, currently there is only about three percent of our total investment uh, going to Philippines among the ten Southeast Asian countries. However, as also mentioned by the ADB paper, uh, ADB paper in recent years, companies, Taiwanese companies find uh, uh, a Philippine more attractive because of the because of the country's uh, new policy to encourage to encourage more manufacturing industry and also because uh, the country's external relations like the GSP provided by US provided a GSP plus provided by uh, uh, by EU and also uh, 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 in China is becoming more difficult for exportation uh, exportation from, from that country why not come into a, a country that is more friendly and, and, and the country that have more abundant uh, labor force? So uh, this is the trend of Taiwan's uh, F, uh, uh, investment in the past. So uh, in the 90s, in the 90s, uh, half of our outbound investment goes to China. And uh, in the 20s, uh, from 2000 to 2012, Three quarters of our outbound investment going to China, and that has been too concentrated for many, many years. And uh, what happened is after 2017, because of the trade uh, attention with U.S. and also because of China uh, changing uh, the changing Taiwan, a uh, changing uh, Chinese investment uh, environment, and also uh, the rise of other countries in terms of attracting more investment. And uh, so, uh, be, uh, 2017 beyond, 
uh, Taiwanese companies still look at China as a huge domestic market, but they go to the U.S., they go to Vietnam, they also go to India, and uh, and also uh, a, a company also go to other 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 countries, Cambodia, Myanmar. They also uh, take interest in Myanmar, Thailand because Thailand has an, has a new policy, the uh, 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 Thailand 4.0, and also the Philippines. So this is uh, the new South Bank policy, which is announced by President Tsai uh, uh, in Taiwan in 2016, and has entered into full uh, implementation uh, uh, for three years. So uh, under this policy, we target 10 Southeast Asian countries together with six uh, South, A uh, South, uh, South Asia countries, including uh, India and Bangladesh, etc., and also New Zealand and uh, Australia. Uh, in this 18 among these 18 countries, we prioritize in particular six countries. These are India, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Malaysia, and also the uh, Philippines. So uh, this is Taiwan Philippine Economic uh, Partnership. Uh, long before the New South Bank policy, we have um, long, uh, very close economic ties and trade relations for Philippines for more than three decades. Uh, we visit uh, we visit a number of Taiwanese companies here, and some company have been have been here for 37 years, 35 years, and now they have their second or third generation to take care of their business here. Uh, and in recent years, uh, it's more about investment two decades ago, and now uh, in recent years, uh, the bilateral relations have moved toward a full-fledged partnership and friendship, uh, entering into broader area of cooperation, including trade, investment, education, labor and human resources, and also tourism. And the emerging area is about smart agriculture or aquaculture. For example, we're going to visit a Taiwanese company which has uh, invested, uh, it has invested uh, two years ago, 10 million US dollars in developing an aqua aquaculture, uh, aquaculture uh, 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 area in Tarlac, in Tarlac. And Philippines and Taiwan should take advantage of the current global and regional economic environment to promote more collaboration between government agencies, business and NGO, and also research institutions. That's why uh, CIA and also PITS is uh, developing uh, this uh, joint uh, research collaboration. And this is trade between Taiwan and ASEAN countries. And Philippines is currently the fourth largest trade partner with Taiwan. Uh, after Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam, and uh, uh, we have large, we have larger trade among uh, between the two countries compared uh, compared with our trade uh, trade trade uh, volume with uh, uh, with Thailand. And this is foreign workers, uh, foreign workers in Taiwan. Currently, we have uh, foreign workers from four from four Southeast Asian countries: Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Philippines. And uh, this is our foreign workers in agriculture, manufacturing, uh, industry, and construction. And uh, uh, this is this is Vietnam. Vietnam currently Vietnam worker uh, currently uh, occupies the number one place in terms of foreign workers in in uh, uh, industry, manufacturing industry. And then uh, followed by Philippines. We have currently we have currently. Uh, we have currently uh, 122,000 uh, 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 Filipino workers in, uh, in Taiwan. And this shows you a very interesting point I mentioned yesterday. Because if you look at a uh, breakdown of these sectors, uh, sectors, you will find that uh, uh, Filipino workers have a, a unique presence in two sectors. One is electrical, uh, no, one is computers and electronic, and this, uh, this color represents Filipino workers. So they are major source of workers in this sector, and in terms of electronic parts, electronic parts, okay, more than 60% of uh, foreign workers in electronic parts are from the Philippines, okay. I know a number of very large technology companies, they all uh, they all have Filipino workers uh, as, uh, in their companies. Actually, right now, Filipino workers make up of the major workforce in, 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 in this uh, very large technology company. Uh, 
and this is the tourist arrivals from Southeast Asian countries, and this is um, uh, Philippines. This is the purple. The purple, yeah. Purple is the Philippines. So within uh, this, within uh, less than less than two years, we have tourists. Uh, coming from Philippines with a number of uh, less than 50,000 to uh, uh, more than 200,000. So uh, we wish you to come, come more so that we can show you uh, Taiwan and then we can talk more about how we can collaborate uh, in the future. So uh, the conclusions and challenge, uh, the challenge, uh, whether China or uh, China and uh, US will reach a trade deal or not. I think the most experiences uh, we learned in the past in the past months is um, China-U.S. rivalry and trade conflicts will escalate in the future, and the Taiwanese company realize this, so uh, they will sooner or later find uh, some places outside China for their future operation operations. And according to my institute's a survey uh, taken in mid December last year. More than 60% of, of the Taiwanese company which have operations uh, in China well or already uh, planning for new investment in other country. And 40% of them may consider to invest back in Taiwan, and while 65% of them will consider uh, 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 to invest in Southeast Asia for, uh, 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 for manufacturing or for services. And the relocation of manufacturing operation may lead to decentralization of China center supply chain and emerging new Asian factories. And China has said that they don't want to be Asian factory anymore because that really gives them a lot of too much pressure and threats. And right now we see a possible new emerging Asian factory. One is Vietnam, which is already uh, regarded uh, regarded as a new Asian factory of textile and garments, and uh, uh, contributed a lot by Taiwanese investors. There's, there's. In Taiwan, the Philippines uh, have built closer business and people-to-people -people ties in the past few years, and two countries should work together to make the most of the current changing international economic environment and promote supply chain collaboration. Uh, we heard from our tackle office here that uh, in the past years, we see in addition to electronic company, they now took, uh, take more interest in this country. And um, last year, we see also two large, uh, uh, large uh, investment project by a uh, Taiwanese company here in footwear and also textile. Why are they here? Their American clients asked them to come because the American clients, the brand owner, etc., they don't want their suppliers too much stocked in China. They want their suppliers to diversify. So they consider Vietnam and Philippines as the two most potential replacing China as the, as the place for their suppliers. So that's uh, that the fact that U.S. and the uh, Philippines very close economic relations also help uh, contribute to Philippines to become a rising or emerging place for electronic and other uh, more intensive industries in, the, in, in this region. So that this is uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comprehensive presentation, Dr. Su. Um, our, la our last presenter for today will discuss about the topic on RCEP and the future of Asian free trade agreements, a Philippines, uh, Philippine perspective. He is a foreign affairs research specialist at the Center for International Relations and Strategi Strategic um, Studies of the Foreign Service Institute. He undertakes um, policy-oriented research and analysis on trade and trade-related matters under the International Organizations section. He has participated in various local and international conferences and seminars focusing on international relations and development. He has also published articles on ASEAN integration, Philippine trade policy, internet economy, and sustainable development. His areas of interest include political economy, public policy, development, and e-commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jovito Kalipat. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, before I begin, I would like to thank the KBS 
uh, as the convener of the ASCN and the Shoma Institution for uh, Economic Research for hosting this event and for bringing us together. Uh, just before I start, I'd like to uh, give you a brief background on, on the on the uh, my presentation. But basically, it's about our segment, the future of Asian free trade agreements. But I widened it to include discussions on the CPTPP and other free trade agreements as well. So we revised the new title is The Future of Free Trade Agreements in the Asian Pacific, uh, Philippine Perspective. And this is an article I wrote in 2017. So I updated it because of Trump, I mean, the ascension of President Trump. Uh, he's, he's, he's still the US president. So, uh, President Trump, uh, the uh, development regard to Japan and EU and other regions, uh, other countries in the region as well. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. First, I, I give an overview of FTAs in the Asia Pacific. Second is politics of FTAs. Third is the future of Asian free trade agreements amid uncertainty. Fourth is projections and actual involvement. We look at the Philippine context. And the last one is the policy considerations for the Philippine government. Uh, before I continue, I would like to uh, emphasize that this presentation is more of a political economy approach to uh, at the regional level. So uh, we heard from the previous speakers the economic and uh, economic aspect of the trade and the uncertainty in the Asia Pacific. This one brings uh, tries to tie it all together at, at the through a political economy perspective. Uh, this is the everything that's happening in Asia Pacific in terms of FTAs. Uh, this is from the Peterson Institute for International Economics, but I uh, revised it. Uh, the solid lines uh, symbolize it as that all of these agreements have come into effect. They are now enforced. Uh, the dotted lines are still uh, in negotiations, under negotiations. And uh, what is new there is that instead of from the TPP, from uh, 12 members of the TPP, because of the U.S. pulling out, opting out with Rowan, it now became the CPTPP. It's just longer, but still uh, the provisions were the same. 22 provisions were suspended, which were pushed by the U.S. But still, uh, this is a parenthesis meaning that the U.S. is not included in the current CPTPP. Uh, also, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico has now revised NAFTA, which is the USMCA, and some of the provisions of the USMCA were uh, inspired by provisions of the CPTPP. The Japan, China, Korea, the street, this is still a work in progress. Countries are talking to uh, create a FEA among themselves, but they're all included in the RCEP, which is uh, this one. This is the RCEP. And this includes ASEAN countries, the six partner members. The goal of the RCEP is really to harmonize the free trade agreements between Asia, ASEAN countries and the six partner countries. ASEAN now has that with the six countries, meaning uh, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, China, and Korea, uh, and India. They have a separate FTA. So the goal of RCEP is to uh, bundle all together, bundle all together into a single FTA. Uh, this is the APEC region, which includes 20 countries. And important to note, uh, between the CPTPP and the RCEP, countries that are in the middle, meaning both of, uh, all of these countries are involved in both the CPTPP and the RCEP are New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. Uh, those countries are both members of the CPTPP and RCEP. Uh, and if you put them all together, basically RCEP, CPTPP, Pacific Alliance, uh, this is the Pacific Alliance, they're all views, viewed as stepping stones or pathways towards the FTAAP, or the Free Trade Area of the Asia Pacific, which is, in context, uh, covers Asia, uh, entire Asia Pacific and basically all of the players in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, looking outside, looking in is the EU Japan EPA, and if I'm not mistaken, this is the biggest today uh, economic partnership agreement uh, between the two large economies between Japan and the EU. Now, uh, what is uh, this is RCEP. Now, this is the members of the RCEP, and just to give you a background on how big it is. 
It encompasses 3.5 billion people, meaning half of the world population, and has a total GDP of 25 billion US dollars. By 2030, meaning once the provisions of the RCEP have taken into full effect, RCEP is projected to augment global real incomes by 286 uh, million US dollars annually and increase global trade by 1.9%. This is according to estimations by Peter Petri and Michael Plummer of uh, Peter's of PIEE, uh, Peter's Institute for uh, Economic Relations. Uh, and uh, this is encouraging, basically, for uh, all members involved for the global trade, uh, for the global community, global economic landscape. Now, for the CPTPP, this, has, this is supposed to be a larger number, but because the US withdrew, uh, uh, it went down, but still, it's still a large number per se. Uh, it covers 500 million people and has a total output size of US uh, 13.6 trillion US dollars. Despite uh, RCEP having uh, greater contributions to global yield incomes and uh, global trade, CPTPP is still, you know, uh, regarded as a mechanism for improving global income gains income gains by 147 billion US dollars. Uh, Petri and Plummer also did an uh, estimation when it could in China and when if CPTPP would include China, the number from 147 billion would increase to 630 million or so, billion or so. So the inclusion of China to CPTPP is something that member economies are looking forward to. Now, the politics of, uh, of uh, FTAs, major actors and dynamics. Around 2017, 20, well, even uh, 2016, 2017, the hot issue is that <coughs> CPTPP before is uh, like a US-led trade agreement, and rightfully it is. And the RCEP is a China-led agreement. And so people cannot Observers and uh, analysts cannot help, and even policymakers, but compare those two agreements as rival trade agreements. Uh, and this is taken as, uh, and I'm speaking as, uh, uh, as an uh, from an academic standpoint. Not, uh, I'm not wearing my hat as a, a policy, as a, as a official of, or a member to the FA. Uh, uh, but I just do. I'm not. I do not reflect. My my, my point and views are not reflective of the. Uh, situation. <laughs> just, just to not confuse it. Okay? Uh, well, this is a, this is a tricky talking about politics, right? It's a tricky issue. Right? Uh, uh, well, as I mentioned, or was I? Uh, CPTPP and RCEP, uh, rival agreements. Is the perspective is that CPTPP is something that the US is promoting to counterweight the global, the rising power of China. As a as a in the region as a global player, and so the issue of to see this trap or is it an issue of Kindleberger trap are very much uh, at play during that time. But because the U.S. withdraw, basically it was led by President Trump and all his beliefs and everything. Uh, it was somehow the discussion was put on the side uh, the, uh, on the uh, sideway, and. Basically, there was a there was a lot where in what would happen to TPP. Japan was very much uh, it was uh, it was wooing the United States to come back in. Like we're still opening the door for you. Uh, but there was a point where in Japan uh, turned around and said we will leave uh, the CPTPP without the U.S. even without the U.S. And so because Japan emerged as the leader of CPTPP. It's a signal that there should there's now a greater leadership uh, within Asia in terms of world trade. Supposedly it was the US before now, right? But because Japan signaled that or showed that we're ready to take the lead in terms of pushing for the CPTPP, and CPTPP, my view, is it's a next generation, uh, it's a 21st century trade agreement, meaning it encompasses a number of provisions that are very much high standard, uh, that are very much uh, comprehensive and very much somehow thought of as domestic issues that have become uh, globalized and regionalized. 
Uh, in terms of RCEP, and I wrote this in, in my article, the, the perception is that it's a China-led agreement, but it's not. It's, it's an ASEAN-led agreement. It's a China-backed agreement, and there's a difference between that. And so the, the idea about RCEP, it's, it's an ASEAN-centric agreement, and so the focus is that it's a developing centric agreement, centric agreement, developing country centric agreement, uh, compared to the TPP or now the CPTPP, which is which was led by developed countries. This was a developing country agreement, uh, developing country centric agreement. And so what it highlights is that there's still, there's a increasing role of regional organizations such as the ASEAN, alongside a more visible regional player in China. And so the issue of politics uh, comes into play, regional politics. How is ASEAN trying to balance its relations with China in terms of pushing for, these, uh, for this specific agreement? For the Philippines, it was at a unique position. In 2015, it was a big chair in ASEAN. Uh, it was the ASEAN chair in 2017. And the clamor was that supposedly two years ago, RCEP was already been concluded, but it did not. It was not concluded for so many issues that I, I I'll discuss later. Now, uh, this is what's really the future of Asian FTA submitted certainty. And uh, one important observation is that from the usual FTAs, which cover trade in goods, uh, trade in uh, uh, trade in goods, and also investment. It now includes a number of 21st century issues such as the environment, state-owned enterprises, intellectual property, e-commerce, competition policy, and dispute settlement. And it entails that countries who do not have high-level standards in terms of regulating and trading with other countries, specifically in these uh, fields, or issue areas must adopt to the standards being pushed by the CPTPP. And I say CPTPP because it's far more advanced than RCEP. Uh, and then it leads to two noteworthy observations. Number one is that, as I mentioned a while ago, it mandates uh, economies who are part of the CPTPP and who are also interested to join the CPTPP to undertake major reforms, domestic reforms. And I'll, give a, I'll discuss that later. And then the second one is Asia is marching towards greater liberalization. And this is in contrast to what is happening on the other side of the world, which mentioned by uh, uh, Ms. Paragiri, uh, Ambassador Paragiri and uh, Marcella and Martina Rising Protectionism. Uh, there's a contrast, you know, uh, Asia is leading the march towards opening up the global economy, putting people, uh, putting economies together compared to the other side of the world. We're in protectionist, populist policy, bringing jobs back into their country and uh, restraining future uh, trade agreements. But caveat, you know, uh, and I put it as a caveat because I, I don't think 90% of people in this room saw the ascension of Trump into presidency. And so, uh, would this happen in Asia? I uh, just put it in there for, for the sake of discussion. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, is there going to be another Trump among Asian Pacific countries? We don't know. And if that happens, it's destructive. People will stop Asian Pacific. Well, uh, there's a discussion for that, but <laughs> another discussion for that. But uh, I mean, I just put it out there. Is, is there going to be another Trump? When, when, when I say another Trump, meaning is there going to be another leader who would challenge the establishment of their country, uh, the established norms of their country? And also, in terms of membership arrangement, is it better for more or less? Because when we talk about RCEP, it's already a done deal, meaning it's about asset countries and the six partner countries. But when we talk about the CPTPP, they're opening up for everyone who's interested to join. But the issue is, should it, uh, would, would, would more countries lead to the second bullet, to the demise of the WTO? Meaning, because of the deadlock and negotiations, 
uh, in the WTO, would these lead countries, would, would, uh, would these countries divert their attention to focus on FTAs and plurilateral agreements? Right now, it's happening. I mean, the evidence speaks for itself. Countries are moving towards plurilateral agreements, sector-specific agreements, because basically, there's a uh, deadlock at, at the multilateral trading system. Uh, with regards to issue of uh, membership, the Philippines has expressed that we would like to join the CPTPP, but uh, because of domestic requirements, domestic reforms that must be undertaken, uh, uh, we, has, we still has, we are not able to invite the, the committee of the CPTPP to come into us. We've done that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 2016 or 2015, to, uh, but they, they relay that you need to undertake this type of reforms. And then the last point is, as I mentioned a while, uh, during the first part, will the RCEP and the TPP serve as pathways towards the free trade area of the Asia Pacific? And who are the possible drivers? Uh, right now, it's APEC and China as, as possible drivers. APEC and or China. APEC and or China as possible drivers towards FEAAP. Now, the question is, because President Trump has opted and has decided that the U.S. would focus on itself first, on America first policy, would questions now, a question now is, would this lead to the U.S. having a less visible role in APEC? To, to be honest with you, I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard anything on that, but, uh, but what is, Evident is that China has an increasing role in, in the regional, uh, in, in, in the Asia Pacific. Now, for the Philippine context, and, and I'll make this quick, uh, Corona on, uh, Cesar Corona 10 uh, projected that Philippine participation in the RCEP has an overall impact on the country within the period 2014 to 2023, and the sectors that would win if this materializes are construction, transport and machinery equipment, and services, while rice and textile industries will experience contraction during the 10-year period. Commodity prices will also decline, real household incomes will rise, and for 2.4 billion worth of US dollars uh, of FDI will be poured in the Philippine market. All poverty indicators, as well as the Gini coefficient, will likewise decrease, and RCEP will bring in additional welfare gains of 4.5 billion US dollars. But as, uh, as, I, as I wrote in the article, these are mere projections. It depends still on how can we realize these gains and how can uh, the Philippines, Philippine government take advantage of these projections or uh, these policies. Now, for the CPTPP, estimates by Petrin Plummer show that non-participation in the Philippines would basically not bring any change, zero. The number is zero in the country's real income and export by 2030. And so, the, if you read that, the initial assumption is, so why join the CPTPP? The, the, the argument is that joining the CPTPP along with Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand will lead to an increase of country's real income worth 13 billion US dollars. Uh, and I have to uh, underscore that this must include the participation of Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. And this is the estimates of uh, Petri and Plumber. They, they included, uh, they call it the CP, CPP 16. CPTP 11 plus the five countries involved. Uh, only then, if that materializes, then the Philippines can grip to a 13 billion US dollars in terms of uh, uh, increase in real income by 2030. And this could rise to 20 billion if the CPTPP 16 is joined by China. On exports, an additional, uh, exports, an additional 29 billion can be ripped by the country if CPTPP 16 happens and China joins the CPTPP would even raise it to 51 billion US dollars. And so, uh, if you're not really an economist and key on the matter, the basic observation is that it's still an increase. 
is still huge. Still, we're talking about billions of dollars. But for uh, the Philippine context, the involvement right now, and this is at the ASEAN level, we have enforced the AFTA ASEAN Treaty Agreement, uh, entered in force in 1999, was signed in 1992, the ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement, and uh, we're also taking advantage of the ASEAN FTAs, the single individual FTAs with these countries, and bilateral we have the PJEPA, and more recently we have the uh, Philippine Europe, uh, European Free Trade Area, FTA, which includes a number of countries. We're still negotiating the uh, Philippines EU FTA, but there's some hold out with, uh, regards, specifically regarding the IPR issue, the intellectual property rights issue. Uh, FTA is in the pipeline, as I mentioned, the uh, Philippines EU FTA and the RC. Uh, in terms of CPDPP, <coughs> Finance Secretary Dominguez mentioned that the Philippines would, is willing to join if U.S. would rejoin the, uh, the agreement. But businesses, APEC uh, Business Advisory Council, has urged the government to partake in the CPTPP and Pacific Alliance. And uh, at my observation is that the government is poised to do, to, to do so because it's basically pursuing an independent foreign policy and its diversifying trade partnerships. Uh, and this is the last part. And, uh, policy considerations for the Philippine government. Number one is undertake and effectively implement domestic reforms. And uh, this focus, uh, the focus is on enablers of trade, uh, specifically if you're talking about FTAs, needed to maximize the benefits. Uh, examples include trade facilitation and trade logistics. Uh, we the Philippines is party to the WTFA, Trade Facilitation Agreement, and we're, we have some progress on it. We have the, the single uh, network initiative, uh, I forgot what it's called, but I think it's trade.net.gov.ph. It's for uh, exporters and importers alike who wish to do imports and exports, and it's online based. Also include the uh, provision of ict related infrastructure, is very much important for the SMEs and for other enterprises as well, and uh, enforcing the ease of doing businesses, uh, doing business and Philippine Competition Act. Competition uh, as an important ingredient in promoting uh, a healthy trade environment domestically, <coughs> and the hope is that it would include the co uh, increase the competitiveness of uh, local businesses to tap into the global value chains and increase their position to global value chains. The hope is that, aside from electronics and other uh, involvement, deep involvement, we would uh, source out to other types of source, uh, industries as well. Second is to e extend assistance to firms, especially MSMEs, to ensure higher utilization of FA preferences. The information campaign of the doing business in free trade area is a good starting point, but uh, <coughs> the perennial issues of access to finance technology and uh, SME clustering are still very much uh, important aspects uh, or important mechanisms in increasing the participation of MSMEs in uh, FTAs. Third, incorporate FTA-related principles into national and local development plan strategies. Uh, to be honest with you, if you talk to LGUs, if you talk to local level firms, the orientation is that we should prioritize local businesses, we should prioritize local products. But I think what's important to highlight is that the trend towards integration, the trend towards foreign products and foreign businesses coming in the Philippines to compete with the local businesses it's good. It's gonna continue. It's it's not. I, I don't see any protectionist tendencies from the country right now, and uh, in general in Southeast Asia. And so the the message, as we've been saying ever since AEC or even after AEC, is that Philippine businesses should be able to understand that competition with foreign businesses and uh, uh, foreign players is. More or less, it's going to be an everyday kind of thing. Uh, they must account, uh, they must uh, put into consideration that 
despite the, the local orientation of their products and such, the mindset is that export orientation. You, you try to uh, look outside of the country. And this is uh, the last slide. Uh, for the Philippines, I guess, at, at the regional level, it must, it must navigate the Asia-Pacific's FTA landscape without the leadership of the U.S. in the near term. And this is exemplified in the absence uh, of the U.S. in the three major trade deals in uh, RCEP, uh, CPTPP, and Japan-EU FTAs. Uh, for the longest time, uh, Philippines, U.S., partnership, special economic partnership, we've been taking the lead from the U.S. Uh, and rightfully so because the U.S. Have been, has been uh, promoting the international liberal trading order, the multilateral trading order, along with other countries as well. But right now the question is how, how should the Philippines, you know, pursue these FTAs without, with a less visible presence of the U.S. And the last is, and uh, I think this is this speaks to uh, this underscores the work of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Philippines should advance the rules-based liberal international training order, while also foster deeper regional integration through ASEAN and APEC. Uh, it's not. It's not an. Uh, I would. Uh, it's not an issue of should the Philippines do more. Uh, should focus more on regional integration and uh, stay away from multilateral trading system, we can, my, my message is that we can do both, you know. Uh, of course, there are some priorities that might be put on hold, but the Philippines has been benefiting from uh, the WTO because of the uh, MFN and the national treatment uh, uh, principles. And uh, right now, the Despite the gloomy nature of the WTO negotiations, the liberal international trading order still benefits a number of majority of countries compared to uh, international trading system that focuses on protectionism and a number of clusters. And uh, with that, I'd like to end my presentation. And thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for your uh, comprehensive presentation, Mr. Kabikba. May I now uh, call Dr. Su and uh, Mr. Kabikba to please occupy the, the, the two seats in front for the open forum. So uh, just a gentle reminder uh, to our participants, please state your name and uh, mention the, your agencies or your affiliations before asking the question. Now, who would like to draw the first question? Yes, Dr. Julian. You know, I was invited here to throw the first question. Okay, so <laughs> my question is to uh, uh, Christy Shu. Okay. According to your statistics, you made a survey of uh, Taiwanese uh, firms uh, doing business in China and uh, 60% are willing to return to Taiwan and another 40% are willing to transfer to Southeast Asia. This, your FDA there is around 70%, as you mentioned. Now, is this uh, trend due to the imposition of the United States of trade sanctions on China? Okay. Or the, the reason why I'm asking this is that there are two parts. If this is going to be temporary, and there will be a democratic president after I don't know when, okay, uh, I'm sure it will be a different uh, international trade policy. The second implication of this, if you move and that's a sizable amount of foreign investment. Will China not retaliate? That's 50% of Taiwanese investments withdrawing from China. What will China respond? This is 
is really very important uh, question. Therefore, we don't openly discuss this debate in Taiwan. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> because you do raise a very important, a few a very important question. The first is, um, who are the respondents? Okay, we made the survey. We made the survey to uh, uh, large listed companies. Uh, 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 a large list of companies. Some of them have operations in China uh, only. Some of them have operations in both China and also Southeast Asian countries. And then uh, the survey find that those who have operations in both China, Taiwan, and Southeast Asian countries benefit the most because by uh, because they can allocate, uh, they can allocate, they can put their orders. Uh, to their Vietnamese operation and have Vietnamese factories to uh, to supply to supply to respond to the U.S. Uh, to to the U.S. orders. But for those who have only operations in China, they have difficulties. So they have to uh, ask their friends or they ask their friends or their business counterparts in, uh, for example, Vietnam to help them uh, handling the orders in the past in the past months. So uh, uh, for those, um, our, re our survey shows that for those who are in China for uh, international markets, uh, a lot of them are thinking of moving out from China. But th for those who are there not for US market, and for those who are there for domestic markets, they will stay, they will stay. So uh, for so it's very obvious that for those who are going to U U U.S. markets, they are either considering uh, uh, to move or they may they may they, uh, they have uh, considered to move or they may plan to move uh, uh, in the next stage, and um, and this is not temporary because in the past in the past year they have found uh, as I mentioned to you the chart. For Taiwanese company, uh, 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 for Taiwanese company investing in China, starting from 2010, our investment going to China has been uh, has been declining for years. It's because they find uh, uh, investing in China uh, facing uh, uh, an increasing problem. For example, the uh, rising wages and also uh, the, their new labor law and also a lot of new policies and also the the, the rise of supply chain because a lot of Taiwanese company find their direct competitors are those uh, Chinese company, and they are taking away all their business. So they have to move from they have to move from China to other other country. So uh, this is uh, not temporary, but uh, not temporary because it has been going on for years. So this is the question for your uh, the answer for your first question. The second question relates to the large companies. For example, Foscom. Foscom has Foscom is among probably the top ten exporter, top ten exporter from China, together with Chinese company, etc. So what uh, Foscom decides will definitely affect uh, China, affect China's policymakers, and also affects uh, affects uh, the perception of Chinese investment environment. So what China, uh, what Foscom did uh, in the past few months is Foscom committed to Trump that Foscom will make huge investment in the United States. Also, Foscom has committed that will go to uh, uh, India. For example, uh, the news yesterday showed that uh, Foscom will do assembly of uh, iPhone, uh, iPhone, uh, iPhone in uh, Indonesia. But in the meantime, Foscom has to continue to invest in China so as not to make China uh, less happy. So a large company has to do rebalancing. So they cannot just uh, 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 leave China. They have to somehow take care of their domestic operation. So what uh, appeared in the past months is for this large, for smaller companies, okay, smaller companies just uh, just quietly left. But for all, for those large companies, they have to somehow uh, take advantage of, uh, take uh, uh, take care of Chinese. Uh, officials' response while they are thinking of moving elsewhere. So for Vascon's case, they have to continue to invest in China so that they can uh, also have large investment in other countries. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes. I don't want to ask. I don't want to ask. Any other question from the audience? Yes, Dr. Serafika. Thank you. 
morning. My question is uh, simpler than the uh, last. You mentioned that uh, Taiwanese investors are now interested in smart cities. Could you elaborate on that? Because it's not exactly an industry. So what do you mean when you know, they're interested in investing in smart cities? Uh, when I came back, uh, when I uh, left Taiwan, uh, we just have a very large exhibition uh, in Taiwan on uh, smart city. Okay, a smart city includes everything that is smart. Okay, uh, smart logistics, for example, smart agriculture, smart aquaculture, and also smart manufacturing and smart manufacturing. And that is uh, one uh, area, one area that Taiwan has been promoting taking advantage of our uh, ICT technology and also of the total solution, total solution. Also taking advantage of our, uh, of the uh, digital economy uh, opportunities everywhere. For example, uh, the Myanmar is talking, in the Myanmar is trying to talk with uh, Taiwan uh, companies to help with Myanmar to build a smart logistics, smart transportation in Yangguang city taking advantage of the infrastructure as well as some uh, total solution package. So that is one area. And as far as I know, uh, as far as I know, some companies are also talking about smart city, smart city project uh, in here. Take, for example, uh, taking advantage of the, uh, 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 the waste, for example, the waste management and also the water and also the water management. For example, yesterday I mentioned here that because uh, uh, because the uh, uh, the price for electricity is so high that some companies here are adopting some smart solution, trying to, uh, for example, the energy saving uh, mechanism so that they can both uh, give a room for the development of smart. I don't know whether there is a term smart electricity, uh, 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 smart energy, uh, uh, energy saving, as well as help uh, the operators here to cost them. Another question from the audience, please. Yes, Dr. Julia. <laughs> this is addressed to Mr. Katiba. You know, you mentioned about uh, all the positive. Uh, effects of uh, joining these free trade agreements. What are the negative effects? <laughs> uh, well, from uh, the, I guess one of the negative effect is that not, effects is that not all of the industries are going to be winners. Uh, some of the industries that I mentioned, uh, textile and rice, are going to be losers in terms of joining the RCEP. Secondly, negative effects uh, there's less, to be honest with you, there's less study on the negative effects. Because <laughs> most of the studies are like, this is going to be positive, this is going to be positive, this is positive. But I guess what I should, what I can talk to you about are the challenges. Uh, one of which is going to be uh, at the domestic level, the lobbying power of local industries, local businesses, especially if we're going to open up the market, uh, goods, services, and I'm talking about RCEP. Uh, services, uh, there are also uh, some provisions on e-commerce. There are also provisions on IP. I think, yeah, there's IPR. And uh, so the issue or the negative, well, the challenges would be if we open up these sectors to countries that are to countries in ASEAN and our six trading partners and who have businesses that are more competitive, that are more high-tech, that are able to come in the country and provide better services, better goods, is that there's some, there could be some displacements uh, in terms of the local businesses. And as I mentioned a while ago, the, really the objective is that to raise the competitiveness of the uh, local business players and the country. Uh, I think that's it. In terms of politics, RCEP is going to be, I think, it's, it's going to be ASEAN-centric. The role of, uh, the concept of ASEAN centrality will always be there, for at least for the near term, for the medium term. Uh, and so, aside from the economic aspect of the RCEP and of joining CPTPP, 
it's a good avenue for the Philippines to expand its trade relations. And when I say expand its trade relations, uh, increasing its trade volume with Cambodia, with uh, Laos, with Myanmar. Of course, we, have, we need to look for some compl uh, for uh, complementarities uh, in terms of industries. Uh, but still, uh, tapping the FTAs, uh, tapping the CRCEP and other mega trade deals as an important mechanism to diversify our trade relations, uh, it's, it's an important tool. Uh, for also, a uh, last point maybe, uh, Philippines should, uh, the Philippine government should look into, as, as uh, uh, reflected in all of the presentations, the experience of Vietnam. I mean, Vietnam is, has, has, has overtaken the Philippines in terms of the next uh, factory of Asia. But I'm not saying that that's the goal of the Philippines because we're service oriented. We were just having this manufacturing service program in the IQ strategy, the industrial strategy that we have now. But we could take cues from the experiences of, the experience of Vietnam. Uh, notwithstanding the uh, notwithstanding the, as, as you mentioned, the less democratic government. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, uh, actually this was in 20, 2014, uh, there, was a, there was a forum in uh, the Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce Forum in the Philippines, it's an annual event, and a, uh, the, the representative from the Korean Chamber of Commerce mentioned that there was, uh, they were, they were supposed to close deals in the Philippines to bring companies here, but they decided last minute to move to Vietnam. Why? Because of the policy stability. Second is the labor costs. And so, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to under, uh, uh, underscore is that there is, there's going to be some negatives, there's going to be some challenges for the Philippines trade-offs in terms of these uh, mega trade deals, but we should learn from it. You know, we should uh, use this as a learning uh, learning point for the Philippines to improve its competitiveness, improve its standing in the at the international economic landscape. You see, I hope I, I, I address some of your points. Thank you very much. Dr. I have a question for Mr. Katimba. I think you uh, mentioned this in passing earlier that um, we invited um, the CPTPP um, board or to to the Philippines, but they had a list of the th domestic regulations or legislation that we need to do in order to be able to join or at least be considered for joining. So could you elaborate on this or maybe provide us with some of the list of all, all the things that we need to do if you, if you could remember that. Uh, well, this was in, uh, I think this is in the, during the TPP, uh, without the U.S. withdrawal, when they're still negotiating, uh, negotiating the TPP, so this was not uh, the, the CPT TPP. But uh, I'm going to ask you, I'm not privy to the conversation that we had, but the tech literature shows that some of the issues that are, well, there's a long list for the Philippines to, to join the CPTPP. But uh, some of the issues that are of importance include uh, e-commerce, uh, IPR. Uh, there's also provision on labor, environment, stable, stable enterprises. Uh, not really, not 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 really on that matter because I think the Philippines is transparent in disclosing. Uh, the records and everything. China has a problem with that. I mean, that's one of the sticking points in terms of the their accession into the CPTPP. But for the uh, e-commerce, IPR, labor, environment, uh, there's also the issue of uh, investor to state dispute settlement, ISDS, uh, foreign ownership. Uh, I, I forgot to mention. Thank you for, for uh, the foreign ownership, the 6040, the 6040 provision that we have, and we've been pushing forward to amend this. But uh, as 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 our president has mentioned, uh, you know, it's the 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 priority are still Filipinos. 
and this is true. But uh, uh, as uh, going back, uh, there's also I think that's 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 the major issues that we're dealing with uh, in terms of market of uh, in terms of access to goods and services. I don't think we have a problem with that. Uh, and what I want to highlight is our set supposedly is uh, it's going to be concluded by this year, 2019. But in January of 2019. The DPI undersecretary mentioned that out of the 18 chapters, only seven have been concluded as of January 2019. And so, I'm one of I'm not a policy elite, but I'm one of the believers of the <laughs> of the survey a while ago that RCEP is not going to be concluded by 2019. Uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, and the country that has been how can I say it? How can I say it in a more diplomatic manner? But the country that is uh, resisting or has some reservations, thank you very much, reservation in terms of the RCEP is India. Uh, I don't know if, if someone is from India or. Uh, but uh, India, uh, for example, the, the regular rate of their tariff. Uh, for FTAs is 86%. The, uh, I'm sorry, 74%, something like that. In RCEP, the countries are pushing for 80% uh, collectively and then lower it down uh, after 15, uh, in the period of 15, 10 to 15 years. Uh, in CPTPP, it's 90%, if I'm not mistaken, and then the next year's associate will be 99%. But it's high, it's high. Uh, and uh, so, there, uh, India, uh, it's also pushing for freer flow of uh, labor uh, within the region, specifically in terms of the IT sector, so that uh, more people can from India can move to uh, other parts of Southeast Asia and the six partner countries as an FTAs. Uh, but the slow pace of the RCEP negotiations simply highlight that the disparity in terms of uh, the disparity among members in terms of economic uh, standing. Uh, the six partner countries, four of them are developed countries: uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, uh, Japan, and South Korea. China uh, has it reached developed country status? Oh, well, it likes to label itself as a developing country for differential and special treatments. But, uh, <laughs> but still, you know, the, the, the difference in terms of the economic standing at the international level is, is uh, pointed at as one of the reasons for the slow movement of the RCEP negotiations. And then secondly, is the sticking points uh, in the negotiations in terms of uh, uh, reservations by India. And, uh, Basically, that's it. The, as I mentioned a while ago, the uh, sorry if I moved too far away from it, but uh, just just to give you more context on what is happening within us, of course, if I'm not mistaken, most of us are really some majority are not familiar with what's happening in RCEP. Unless it's there, then you're gonna be curious. Like it's 90% happening, then you're curious. At least for some Filipinos, and this I'm uh, talking about the grassroots level, you know. Uh, if you ask them really what is ASEAN, ASEAN economic community, the awareness is there, but if you ask them more uh, specific questions, it's, it's still a challenge. And so this points to the fact that Philippines joining mega trade deals would entail that Filipinos at the grassroots levels are aware of the benefits and are aware of the costs of joining RCEP. Uh, it's, at the end of the day, it's still information uh, uh, aware, awareness uh, campaign, uh, telling the people that, hey, we have these FDAs, you can join, you can use the preferences, but there are also some costs. Uh, thank, you. thank you for that, uh, Mr. Katikba. Dr. Su, would you like to add something? Can I add? information to uh, China, uh, Taiwan's investment in China. 
um, we have a lot of investment in China, but in recent years, we find more investment are in the uh, services sector. So for services sector, uh, financial, logistics, land development, they are okay. So those will not leave uh, China. Uh, those who uh, will or are considering to leave are those uh, in China for uh, the manufacturing sector and for uh, international market. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. <coughs> and then to be followed by uh, the gentleman at the back. Well, uh, yes, uh, a final point. The context in which uh, we have been discussing so far, at least uh, on the presentation of uh, Joby, uh, Joby uh, as uh, being the, the using these international uh, agreements are frameworks. But remember that uh, we also need certain economic reforms, which we have to be done, which have to be done, even in the absence of uh, the advantages of uh, this uh, agreement. And note that there is, there is a big uh, difference between a trade agreement and an economic partnership agreement. Okay, sir. Thank you. Um, wait. Excuse me. Any questions for uh, Dr. Zhu? Huh? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering because, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the new soft bond policy is a product of uh, Sorry, sorry, political relations between uh, Beijing and Taipei. So, so I, I'd like to encourage us to the policy continuity um, after President Tsai steps down and a comment on President succeeds her. Uh, what do you think would happen to the to that policy? Um, yeah, that is also a very uh, tough question. <laughs> Um, I don't have time because I have only two min uh, 20 minutes to present to the new South Bond policy, but long before the new South Bond policy, probably more senior people here know that uh, in 90s we have the old uh, Go South policy, uh, 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 and also in early 20s when we had the second wave of Go South policy. So whether it's Kuomintang or Minjin Tang, uh, all, the, all the governments have uh, uh, put their emphasis on uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, in, the early, in, the, uh, in, the, in the earliest uh, Go South policy uh, in the 90s, actually uh, Philippines was on the priority. That's why we had, uh, we had a, a Subi Bay uh, collaboration project, a huge project at that time by President Minh Hue with, uh, the president, with, with the president uh, uh, here. So um, uh, whether, uh, uh, now I understand that you all know we are going to have an election. So uh, what, which political party is going to be the ruling party, we don't know. But uh, I believe uh, either party will continue to put emphasis and regard uh, Southeast, Asia, Southeast Asian uh, countries to be among the most important trading partner and also economic partners for Taiwan because um, you, uh, uh, you can find from my chart uh, there that um, uh, uh, in the past years, uh, long before 2016, when uh, New South Wales policy was adopted, we have a lot more uh, interest in Southeast Asian countries already. And given the RSTAP, whether it's coming uh, this, this year or not, and also given uh, the fact that China, uh, an investment environment in China is getting more and more difficult for Taiwanese companies, uh, definitely Southeast Asian countries are to be uh, uh, among the most important partners for Taiwan. Not only for trade investment, but also for culture, for uh, a people to people exchange, and also for a lot of other uh, collaboration. And I mentioned to you that uh, Philippines has a unique uh, place in terms of providing Taiwan's uh, workforce. Uh, you are right now the most important labor force in Taiwan's technology company. And, uh, and that is very different from Vietnamese workers and also Thailand workers in Taiwan. So I believe we do have a lot of complementarity in uh, different areas. And this is why we had a joint study with uh, the PIDS to explore more potentials we can work uh, uh, currently also for next year. Any other questions from the uh, participants? Okay, sir. Uh, 
Let me address this democracy thing that you brought about. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a joke. <laughs> uh, but let me make a serious point. Um, many of you have uh, read the report called Ease of Doing Business. Uh, in most countries, number one impediment to investment is, the, is governance. So governance is, that's not, it doesn't matter which form of government, it could be in dictatorship, monarchy, or whatnot, but how well a country is governed. Uh, for example, uh, ADD came out with a report on foreign direct investment in 2016. A according to the model, uh, it was done by one of my colleagues, according to the model, if Philippines governance was exactly like that of Malaysia, FDI would double. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, uh, another point I'm trying to make here is uh, movement uh, in terms of FDI movements currently, uh, in those days uh, it used to be driven by labor competitiveness, labor cost competitiveness. Now it is more related to technology competitiveness because we are moving towards workerless factories. Um, Nike, uh, I think, apparently started a factory without, like, with, with absolutely no workers. Uh, so, the, the advantage China may have had in the past could be diminishing unless they become technology competitive, uh, as well as have other issues you brought up uh, in your presentation. Uh, now, the, once you become more technology competitive, what could drive the movement of investment would be distance to market. And that's why uh, some of these companies want to relocate to the United States. Because the largest market is still the United States. And so a company may not want to move out of China because the market is there. But if the market is the United States and China no longer has the labor and uh, competition, why would it be in China? Uh, it probably, it may even without this trade war, uh, to address your point, I think, even without this trade war happening, companies could be moving out of China because China is losing its competitive edge. Uh, that's uh, the point I want to add. Uh, the third thing is about the smart cities. Uh, often it's, uh, it's a, it, the smart city is not just technology, it's an ecosystem. That also brings in the issue of governance. Is that right? So someone, uh, you know, often in, when I do these rounds in these countries, they ask, okay, how do we build a Silicon Valley in our country? <coughs> My answer is, you have to be like a Silicon Valley. Right? So that includes everything, you know, the government structure. Uh, you know, a, a guy like Steve Jobs will not survive in any other country. Right? Because you should be allow you should be allowing for crazy ideas. Okay. So anyway, those are those are my comments. Any feedback to be welcome. Thank you, Mr. Marisima. Dr. Su, would you like to answer? Uh, I think for um, investors they look at policy coherence and policy coherence or policy consistency. So for certain countries, definitely there is no change, there's no risk of change of the government, and also there's no risk of uh, 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 legislation going to parliament and stay there for like uh, three or uh, three or five years. So that's uh, that's something that they also consider when they decide where they are going to. Invest. I think that's a quick point. I don't want to hold everyone uh, between me and Lunch. Uh, but uh, for in terms of the crazy ideas, I think one of the mo uh, one of the important initiative by the Philippine and I refer to regulatory uh, and the Philippine Competition Commission is uh, implementing regulatory sandboxes uh, so that to not discourage uh, innovation to happen, they implement regulatory sandboxes to uh, certain industries that are very much innovating at a faster rate compared to others. And so this allows companies to proceed with innovating, but also uh, not outpacing the regulatory policies that we have. And so I think 
uh, and this refers to governance, you know, the regulation of these types of industries, especially in the era of fourth industrial revolution of companies coming in and companies that are that must not only operate on a certain industry, it blurs almost everything. Biological, physical, uh, online world. And so the implications to society are very much large. And uh, the regulatory sandboxes that the PCA, uh, the Philippine Competition Commission, has implemented, that has initiated, is I think is a good starting point. Uh, in terms of fostering Silicon Valley's uh, second point again, education would be very much important in retaining workers. Uh, there's a survey, I think, by uh, Future Jobs uh, report by World Economic Forum. Around, they, they surveyed G20 countries and around 70% believe that they must train their workers, retrain their workers, and the another 30% mentioned that they would hire other workers outside who has ICT skills. And so, uh, this also underscores your point, that the technology competitiveness, right? Uh, it's, it's really about people adapting to ICT, literacy skills, and uh, having the necessary skills being retrained, but uh, yeah, and uh, look out for the emerging, uh, emerging employment opportunities because the, the the concern is that because of technologies, people would lose their jobs and automations and such. But the report by ADB in 2017 or 2018 showed that the loss of jobs would be offset by the creation of more jobs. But this is ICT anchoring, and so the people who come in must have the necessary ICT skills and be technology at them to, uh, to you know, survive before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. For the last question, anybody? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the So I don't see uh, them raising their hands. So I guess that's the, so that's for the forum today. Once again, Dr. Sumi and um, Mr. Kipa, thank you for your insights and for the active participation of our audience. Now we are ready to listen to the closing remarks from the chairman and the country's um, resident re representative to the Manila Economic and Cultural Office. Friends, uh, I now give the floor to Mr. Angelito Banayo. Because we want to position the Philippines 
as the gateway of Taiwan to markets identified in its new southbound policy and as a hub for its global market access strategies. Thus, in December of 2017, we signed with the Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office, TECO, here in Manila, <clears throat> a new bilateral investment agreement, or investment promotion and protection agreement, the first among ASEAN countries to do so, to lay a stronger foundation for investments coming from Taiwan. This morning's discussions have been very helpful in guiding us towards achieving our objectives of making the Philippines an investment destination for Taiwan bigger and better than it already is. Let me cite two examples of actual economic gains in terms of incoming FDI as a result of the current global trading situation. Wistrom, part of the Acer Group, which moved out its operations from the Philippines to China in 2010, has decided last year to bring back major manufacturing operations to Subic. As a result, seven of its supply chain partners are also setting up shop in the Philippines. The new Kimpo Group, a major OEM company that produces for world brands such as Dyson, Toshiba, Hewlett Packard, etc has announced that it is establishing its Southeast Asian hub in the Philippines and will soon list itself at the Philippine Stock Exchange as Calcom. Over dinner two weeks ago with its CEO, I was told that they will expand their current full-time workforce here from the current 10,000 to 18,000 full-time employees within the next two years. True, most of this, as uh, Dr. Xi has explained, are mostly electronics-based investments with lower value-added effects on GDP, as uh, Mr. Maria Singh has said. But the number of employees that it generates, the number of jobs that it generates, is of great socio-economic value to a country still plagued by poverty, such as the Philippines. Additionally, we at MECO are trying to entice investments from Taiwan out in certain market advantages, such as EU GSP plus privileges, those with the U.S., which last year extended our GSP privileges to include travel goods, and FDA partnerships with ASEAN. A recent locator in the Philippines is a travel goods manufacturer uh, which is going, which is uh, cited in Bataan, and which will employ 5,000 workers, and they're already starting recruitment since January this year. As in the global economic competition, opportunities are time-bound, and windows have narrow openings. My mother, who was half Fujianese, always reminded me of a Chinese saying that means when the heavens open and pours its blessings of rain, be sure you have a basin to catch the water before the earth gobbles up the rain. I wish our often sluggish bureaucracy and the complexities of our extremely legal structures in this country could listen to that Chinese say. To all the speakers uh, this morning, thank you for reminding us today about the opportunities, the advantages, the challenges that we must explore. More importantly, the problems we must address. To all the participants, I hope the rest of the day is pleasant. Thank you very much.